great pleasure of introducing to you today's speaker, Professor Laura Carstensen from the Department of Psychology, who is going to talk to us about teaching critical thinking about gender. And Laura is in a particularly good position to help us think about this question, since she is both an active researcher on the questions of gender and aging, and is the former director of Stanford's very highly regarded Institute for Research on Women and Gender. Laura received her bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Rochester in 1978, and then a master's degree in psychology from West Virginia University in 1980, followed up by a PhD in clinical psychology again from West Virginia University in 1983. She has been a very active and distinguished researcher in the areas of the emotional and psychosocial aspects of both aging and gender, and has already amassed a body of research that consists of three books and almost a hundred articles in essentially every leading journal in her field. And as a result, she has been recognized with a variety of awards, including the Richard Kalish Award in Innovative Research, the Presidency of the Society for the Science of Clinical Psychology, and an advisory position at the Max Planck Institute for Development in Berlin. In addition, she is a fellow of the American Psychological Society, the American Gerontological Society, and the American Psychological Society. Of particular interest to us, and what led to her invitation today, is that she also is a winner of the Dean's Award for Distinguished Teaching from the School of Humanities and Sciences. Essentially, Laura has shown a knack for choosing topics that many of us choose to avoid. Aging, for example, is one most of us Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. Um, you know, aging, too, I pick topics that people have an inherent interest in, and, and sometimes people think they're not interested in aging, but inevitably they become interested in aging. <laughs> I'm going to talk about a course that I've been teaching here at Stanford since 1987, and uh, it's a course on the psychology of gender. Um, professors who, who teach courses about gender have, have one really great advantage. Um, and that is that people come to the course with an inherent interest in the topic. Everybody's influenced by gender. Everybody has one. Um, everybody has thoughts about it. And so there's a, there's a personal relevance that makes it easy to sell in that sense, that makes people, it easy to convince people um, that they should be interested, that they should care. But teaching about gender also has its challenges. People come to the course interested. They also come to the course presuming that they know the answer already. Um, because they already they have one, they've looked at people, they know what men are like, they know what women are like. And so people tend to come to this course already presuming an awful lot about gender. And a lot of what I see as my task is to challenge those kinds of presumptions that they have brought into the class. It's also, of course, a topic that's um, politically and emotionally charged. And I teach a course of about 120 to 150 each time I teach this, um, a group of people who come to the subject matter with varying degrees of information about it, that is, schooled information about it, 
and also various kinds of political and, and moral views about what these answers should be that they're going to, to learn about. Um, the, the course that I teach now is about 50-50 male-female. And by the way, that, that occurred before the gender uh, requirement. So there, there is a, a, a good deal of interest in the psychology of gender from, from male students as well as females. The course also has a lot of psychology majors. It also has feminist studies majors who are again coming to the subject matter with different kinds of background, different kinds of expertise and expectations. And interestingly, almost every year, for some reason, it, the, the course distribution spans the years at Stanford. So I have a comparable number of seniors, sophomores, juniors, and so on. So I mean, we, it's a very mixed kind of a group. Erica Good uh, is a science writer, as many of you know, for the New York Times. And, and she gave a colloquium in the psychology department a few years back. And she talked about two kinds of theories uh, that are presented in the field that science writers deal with uh, or have to be concerned about. She said there are type A theories and type B theories. Uh, type A th theories are theories that are believed in the absence of evidence. And in fact, they're rarely investigated. Um, people know the answers. Uh, and type B theories are theories that no matter how much evidence I show you, you aren't going to believe it. And I think gender theories or people's individual personal theories about gender are kind of both. You know, they, they, people, people have these, these, these views. So one, one of the other challenges that I see in teaching um, a course like this that with, with such a diverse kind of an enrollment is to be able to teach social science. I really want to teach social science, uh, but teach it knowing the kind of political backdrop that I'm teaching this um, course um, um, in, in the context of. And um, being able to treat it in an even-handed way, being able to convince people with evidence. I want to be able to show them social science evidence that'll, that, that they will be able to consume, to evaluate, and to, to feed back into their own kind of, a think, kind, kind of thinking. I have been teaching long enough to know that most of the facts and figures that students learn in any individual course are no longer in long-term memory within a year or so, if you're lucky, after the course has been taught. And so I also teach this course, although I do want to overview and tell people about the recent evidence about various kinds of topics, I also know that they're not going to remember uh, most of them. But I feel passionately about this topic, and I want people to leave the course changed in some way that will help them evaluate information that they're going to read about, hear about, talk about for the rest of their lives. Um, we're pretty much bombarded with information about gender in daily life. And I want students to leave with better tools, both conceptual tools and analytical school tools, so that they can interpret and evaluate the kind of information that they hear. Uh, so the, the course objectives, then, as I see them, are educating a diverse group of students about a topic that's politically and emotionally charged, familiarizing students with recent empirical findings from social science about gender, and then the third one, which is the one that's most important to me, is to teach students how to critically evaluate research findings and their own personal assumptions about gender. So when they come across... Um, evidence like this that they read in the popular press, they'll be able to think about it. Um, this was a cover of Newsweek a few years back, um, um, proclaiming to be able to tell people why men and women think differently. Aha, a study finally has explained this, right? Well, well um, they, the, if you look inside Newsweek, um, they show you the brains of men and women and, uh, again, conclude why men and women think differently. This was a study um, where they ask men and women to simply clear their mind of everything. <laughs> <laughs> Try it. <laughs> they also uh, did an, had another condition where they asked males and females to solve a mathematical problem, and they found that there was greater activation in female brains than in male brains. And I asked my students in class to ask these questions. What am I being asked to believe? What's the evidence? And what are alternative explanations? When they come across information like this that's presented to them, 
Um, and regularly throughout the class, as I'm overviewing different kinds of findings, I return to this basic kind of set of questions and ask people again to evaluate whatever it is we're, we're reading about in social science in this critical manner. This is how the, how the course works. It's kind of a production, and it requires a lot of people involved. Um, there are lectures, and I give most of the lectures. We also occasionally will have uh, a guest panel. We had a guest panel today of parents who talked about parenting and uh, differences between becoming a mother and becoming a father and how that feels subjectively. It was a great, great panel. So occasionally we do that. But most of the time, I'm giving lectures. We also have discussion groups, and those are in the evenings um, run by the course assistants or uh, brown bag lunches that I run throughout the quarter so that students can come to those and talk about anything they want to talk about. Um, this is, again, this is a, it's a subject matter that has a lot of personal relevance to a lot of people. You read the literature and you find out that you're being discriminated against, and you can likely expect to be discriminated against in the workforce if you're a person of color or you're a woman. I mean, we, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that's true. So in lectures, I'm telling people this, and the students are sitting there thinking, <laughs> what am I supposed to make, about, make, it make of that? And what am I supposed to do with it? And so we supplement the lectures with these kinds of discussion groups where students can come and talk about um, what this means to them. Or in the case of discussion groups just prior to an exam, what the exam will be on. <laughs> Suddenly, the, the questions and the concerns change around that time. There is a, a course website uh, that we set up for the first time um, ever that I've taught the course before. And when I say we, I really mean Greg Larkin, who is here and I owe a great debt to for um, helping with this course. But this website has made a lot of difference, I think, in the class. Um, it, it provides the opportunity to um, distribute syllabi, for example, to the students who missed getting them the day you picked it, um, passed them out so that they can pick up things like that or course handouts. The, the list of readings for the course is also um, here on, on the, available on the website. And then articles are articles related to questions that come up throughout the class. So students will often ask about something, and I can then give them more reading about it in addition to answering it. And this has ended up being a really nice thing to have as the course is going on. And students have now started to email me with references from either the popular press um, or scientific journals that they've read. And so we can now post those in addition. And again, I think it makes students feel like they're involved in the course and, and, and what people are doing. Um, we can put up information about exams, about the discussion groups, topics, and, and also just announcements so we can get information um, out to people when something changes or somebody has a question or several people ask and then we can just send them, refer them to announcements and, and, and that seems to be helpful in terms of the course format. By the way, I brought syllabi and um, handouts describing in greater detail the research projects and so if people are interested in those, we could just maybe pass these around. Um, there's yeah, two different handouts. Another big piece of this course um, it, it concerns research projects. I, in the first couple days of class, ask all of the students who are enrolled to sign up to be a member of one of about 15 to 18, depending on the size of the class, research groups. So they've got about 10 to 15 students in these research groups. And I ask them to meet as a group. Uh, formulate uh, a, an idea and operationalize a hypothesis, go out, collect some data on that topic, and bring it back to the class. So in the last three days of class, we set aside some time for, for research project presentations, and the groups present um, to the rest of the class what they found. Again, these research projects, uh, historically, are, are terrific. They're really interesting. Um, the, the data are usually collected based on observations or surveys from Stanford students, so they're finding out about the people they, they, they live with and, and interact with day in, day out. So they tend to like those a lot. And it also, I think, allows an opportunity for students to get to know other students who have this interest and to be able to put them on a team so that they're now working together with other students in class as opposed to feeling polarized from other students in class. 
And so the research groups, I think, also have a very nice kind of social psychological benefit to them. The research groups are um, all assigned the same grade. And this upsets many Stanford students, the idea that their grade will be influenced by anyone other than themselves and their, their own performance. But what I tell them is that part of the assignment in this, for this group project is to learn how to work together um, and to come up with some kind of high quality um, product at the end of that. Most of these group projects receive A's. They're, they're just great. It's not because I'm saying I want to give everybody an A. They, they do very well. You put 10 to 15 Stanford students together and you'll come up with somebody who knows how to do data analysis, somebody else who knows how to do um, media, somebody else who's in the arts, somebody else, you know, you put, them all, put all these people together and they end up being really interesting and creative kinds, kinds of projects. I did a few years back though, when every, every quarter I teach this, there's a student or two who aren't, they just aren't carrying their weights in, in these groups and the students will come and say, so I, I, I added a new rule to this and that's that your group can vote you out of the group. <laughs> Um, with a majority vote and so everyone should be on their best behavior to make sure that they get to stay in the groups because otherwise they'll be doing a research project on their own and that's a lot of work. <laughs> so um, they, they tend to work together very, very well. And again, it sets this opportunity for students to be able to have this kind of interchange, to feel like they're in control of their group and, and I think it has some, some very nice benefits. The, the, first, the first third, I would say, of the lectures that I give in class um, lay out three different theories, and I'll return to the theories momentarily. But I want to give students different ways of evaluating and thinking about findings. Um, that is, different theoretical accounts of why we see these kinds of gender differences. So that they, and by having alternatives, they can play with these different alternatives and think of what, how they might explain a finding in a different way than, say, the researchers are, are offering an explanation for a particular kind of a finding. So I, I spend a lot of time early on in the class laying out the theories, and then subsequent lectures are primarily concerning recent findings in the psychology of gender. And you can, again, see on the syllabus what those topics are. They include things like um, cognitive differences between males and females, masculinity and femininity, um, emotion, emotional differences, and both the experience of emotion and the regulation of emotion between males and females, intimacy, sexual orientation. We talk about work. We talk about achievement, uh, the transition to parenting. And of course, we talk about aging. Um, and again, differences uh, for males and females and the aging process. And then the last three classes so, um, are these research project presentation. So the students kind of take over in the last three classes and they become in, involved in presenting new material uh, hot off the presses. Are there questions about the process of this course or anything I've said so far? That, feel free to interject. Yes, the, the students can sign up. If, if there's a group of people who know each other, they can sign up and make sure they're all in the same group. Most of the time, students don't, and they'll just put their name on a different, on a list, and so they end up being pretty mixed. Rarely is a group entirely comprised of people who already know each other. But the other thing I do is to tell them at, during the sign-up, it takes a couple classes to make sure everybody's there and gets signed up and, and enrolled in one of these groups. And if people are already talking and saying, we want to study this, they can write on top what the content of the research project will be and then recruit people for that particular topic or interest. Yes? Has any group voted a member Mm-hmm. Yeah. What happened to He did his own project. And it, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad what he did, the project. Um, on, uh, it, he, yeah, it was, it was okay. It wasn't great, but it was okay. I think what was the best thing for me in this experience is he didn't feel that he'd gotten a bad deal. He was also recognized that he hadn't come through. I mean, he just wasn't showing up for any of the group meetings and wasn't uh, um, carrying his load. 
and I think it did shake him up a little bit to have to do this. And he um, um, really pulled it together in the end and did something interesting. And so it, I, I felt like overall it was kind of a success that the group process worked. Um, I, you know, I think, again, these groups are large enough that to have a whole group turn on you, um, and it usually means you're doing something that's a little off. Um, so they, they tend to be people, they, they get along together. They divide up work responsibilities together. Often the whole group won't ever meet in its entirety together because of scheduling. Scheduling is one of the toughest things. So, so they'll have some, some kind of a meeting, say, right after class just to touch base, and then they communicate over email, sep usually divide themselves into subgroups, like the group that will do the data collection, the group that's going to write the report, the group that's going to present. And so they, they, they tend to find ways to, to make it work. Yes? No, I've never done that, no. The groups are kind of their, that's, that's their part of, of the class. They run it, they control it. Good question, yes? I just wondered if you can access your website or Yes, oh yes, yes. And it's on the syllabus, the web address, so please do, yes. Yeah. Yes? Um, I wonder with the lectures are, are interactive. Do you have a special lecture or do you limit it to just presentations? When I'm lecturing? There's, I strongly encourage people to ask questions. Um, I like talking with people much more than lecturing at them. And so when, uh, over the, the course of the quarter, I can begin to feel like I kind of know who people are a little bit from the kinds of questions that they ask. And I like that a lot better. I also think it's a lot easier to, to listen to <laughs> when things are interrupted occasionally and there's, there's more of a dialogue in, in, instead of a monologue. Especially also, I do most of the lectures. And, and so, you know, when twice a week, you know, 9.30 in the morning, you know, you're listening to the same person go on and on. Um, I just think it becomes more interesting if that's broken up um, occasionally. Yeah. And regarding questions, one of the things I like about encouraging questions as well is that questions will often raise politically charged concerns. And I want those on the table. So I want students to feel perfectly comfortable asking a question like, isn't the reason most women are not engineers is because they're not as good at spatial tasks? I talk about some research findings, some cognitive findings showing that males are better at some kinds of uh, spatial tasks than females are. Females are better at other verbal kind of tasks than, than males and some kinds of spatial tasks than males. So there's, there, there are these differences. And I want people to be able to say, isn't that leading to this so that we can really talk about it. The answer, by the way, to that question is, no, it doesn't explain <laughs> why 1% why of women, and you'll see why shortly. Uh, these, the, the differences, um, essentially, the, the, the findings, I don't want to go too much into the findings in psychology of gender, we'll never get through this the overview of the course, but essentially, when you compare male and female performance in the laboratory, that is, you get highly controlled conditions, present everyone with exactly the same uh, stimulus, and measure the response in a very careful way. The differences between males and females on virtually anything, even things that you may presume there are differences, like empathy, the differences are nil when you really look at it closely. And then as you zoom out and begin to look at behavior in everyday life, you begin to look at success, say, in the occupational uh, domains and so on, then you start to see these big differences. But I think it's very important to also know that there isn't, the, the, when one looks at the basic fundamental differences between males and females, where they're, they're few and far between, and they're small. And then they start to get bigger as we see them play out in the social world. So that's the course. Really, but. <laughs> um, so there are, there are two kinds of recurring themes that go on throughout this class. One concerns the theories. I lay out three different theories. and. Um, return to them as we consider every one of the empirical findings that they read about in the second part of the course. And the other recurring theme concerns variability, and I'll return to that momentarily. The, the theories that I offer um, the students within which to consider the findings that they read about are psychodynamic theories, from Freud to more modern psychodynamic um, interpretations of gender 
like Nancy Chodorow's uh, theory about gender differences in mothering. So the, the psychodynamic theories of gender suggest that it's through development, through the acquisition of personality, through the development or the emergence of self, one becomes male or female. So one, there, it's, it's a, a typological kind of an approach to gender. You are male or you are female. And it emerges as part of your emergence as a person. And so gender is fundamentally tied to everything that you do. Um, it's a piece of, of who you are in terms of your whole personality, that gender is part of it. The biological theories are, are rooted in evolutionary theory. So these are the theories that would suggest that a lot of the differences between males and females are related to genes and or hormones um, that, that males and females are, are more and less exposed to. Evolutionary theory would predict differences between males and females in terms of aggression, in terms of um, sexual um, uh, contact, sexual um, um, interchanges, in terms of nurturance. Evolutionary theory leads to predictions, or has traditionally, about competition between the sexes, that males and females are fundamentally um, after different things in mating, and thus there will always be problems between males and females. That's one of the evolutionary kinds of interpretations of differences. I should mention, and again, I'll try not to go on too much about this, but there are, are some other interpretations or other, other approaches to evolution um, that would suggest that males and females should get along and should cooperate. I mean, you can't reproduce your offspring, your genes. You can't pass them along without some degree of cooperation. Uh, and so, so there, there, there are a lot of what's been passed off as evolutionary hypotheses, differences in jealousy, differences in promiscuity, even differences in, say, something like um, um, rape. And they've been passed off as being consistent with evolutionary theory and what I ask students to do is, let's start with a theory. And would a theory really predict that men would rape women? And you start to take that apart. And it's actually not consistent um, with what evolutionary theory would tell us. So, so that, that's one of the things that we do. So we critically consume these theories, not just sort of offer them, you know, but, but to, to, to also evaluate them as well. And then there are the social cognitive theories. And these are the theories that are far more popular in the social sciences today. Uh, theories that suggest that gender is acquired through learning and socialization. Um, we, early on in life, form uh, schemas, uh, networks of associated ideas. And we, we pull in information about gender specifically to support our gender views. And that's one major um, uh, popular theory of, about gender today. Also, group socialization. Eleanor Maccabee, a colleague of mine, has written a, a great deal about differences that, between males and females that emerge because around the ages of three or four, males and females tend to segregate into um, same-sex groups. And Maccabee argues that they then develop different, it's like, it's like developing in, in a different culture, in different cultures from one another. And that then when males and females come back together again in the workplace or in relationships, that you see differences that emerge in, in the same sense as cultural differences can sometimes lead to different misunderstandings, clashes, differences in, in behavioral presentation. So those are the, the theories that we spend a good deal of time on early in the course. And then we turn to the findings from social science research. Variability. Um, there are two ways to think about variability, and, and um, I try to stress both of them throughout the course. It is incredibly easy, and I have to say it's also incredibly easy for me to fall into something where I'm saying, well, males are this way, females are this way. It's just so easy to do that. And in fact, as I said, most of the differences in basic Psychological processes are very, very small between males and females. And there's a tremendous amount of within sex uh, variability. And there's tremendous overlap. So um, I try to teach them, uh, uh, both in terms of statistics, what this kind of overlap looks like. Um, and then also um, give them some real life kind of evidence. But um, this, both of these are, so these are normal distributions. Let's say pink is for females and blue is for males. Why not? Um, <laughs> you know, two, two thirds of a population will fall within two standard deviations of um, the mean, right? And we see this kind of distribution. Now, most gender differences that you hear about, things like spatial 
uh, mental rotation performances on that. Most of the differences in these basic um, um, skills and abilities between males and females are about half of a standard deviation. So that means that we've got a mean here for females and a mean there for males. And look at the overlap. Um, there's just tremendous variability. So when somebody says, well, but wouldn't I want to hire a man if I want to have a, t a mathematical task performed? It's like, I don't think so. I wouldn't put my money on it. <laughs> Especially when we know that these basic skills and abilities don't map very well onto everyday performance. There are a lot of other things that influence everyday performance, like creativity, like motivation. Um, and so on and so forth. Uh, fatigue, you know, <laughs> a lot of things that play into how well workers perform. So it's very important to keep in mind, and we regularly just keep going back to this and saying, just keep in mind what we mean when we say there's a difference. This is the kind of difference that we're talking about. But of course, statistics can only go so far. Um, there's are still not people presented here. And one of the other things that we try to do throughout the class is to bring faces to the individuals, both males and females, that we're talking about throughout this course. So who do we mean when we're talking about men? And if men are doing something to women, which men? Doing something to which women? And here, again, race and ethnicity come to play. Uh, when one thinks about the differences in the social science findings about gender, you, you have to consider power. Um, and when you come to approach a subject matter that way, it means that race and gender are interacting in just every kind of domain. So I like to remind students regularly um, who we're talking about. Also, that we're not just talking about young college students, uh, despite the fact that most social science research is based on young college students. <laughs> when we talk about what men and women are like, uh, what girls and boys are like, we're not just talking uh, about a Stanford population. And so um, with Greg Larkin's assistant, we, assistance, we used to do this as a slideshow, uh, but um, Greg helped. Um, greatly improve this um, slideshow that I'm going to show you. It's just like five minutes um, that'll show you the kind of thing that we do throughout the class to get people thinking broadly about who males are and who females are.
<laughs> Greg's the man responsible for this. Um, uh, I, I have to say that I think that um, having these visual kinds of reminders when we do various things like this throughout the course is much more effective than showing them the statistical distributions. <laughs> I want them to see both. I want them to understand both. But I think this helps bring, um, bring to life uh, the, the groups that we're referring to when we talk about differences between males and females. Um, so teaching critical thinking. Regularly, we are talking about a particular kind of a finding and then evaluating it within the context of these different theories that I very briefly um, overviewed to you. So regularly, we're returning to the questions, what am I being asked to believe? What's the evidence? And what are the alternative explanations from the one that's being proposed? Um, just about a month ago, there was a, a discovery um, program on gender differences. And some students in class had come to me and said, well, they didn't talk a lot about the theories, but they did talk about the differences. And it was interesting to hear about all these differences between males and females. And so I tracked down um, a, a copy of this program and watched it. And there, there were some interesting and, and, and reasonable kinds of conclusions that were being uh, presented on this program. Um, you know, the Discovery <laughs> series is a good, that's a high quality series. But there were some things that were being said on the series that, you know, it just kind of boggles the mind. It's like, what's the, what? <laughs> what did you just say? What was the conclusion based on that evidence? So um, went back and got some clips. And I'll show you one from this Was program. Are the fairer sex really more sympathetic? To find out, an eight-year-old was left seemingly alone in a busy street and rigged with a secret camera. The girl's mother was asked to stand just out of vision. The girl stood there for 20 minutes, during which time 74 people walked past. Females overwhelmingly show more empathic behavior than males do. And we believe this empathic behavior are tied to the fact that girls and women are more likely than boys and men focus on themselves in order to understand the emotions of others. <laughs> Seven women stopped, and one even called the police. There was no response from the men. Okay. <laughs> I'm being asked to believe that males and females are different, that females decide how they feel based on looking within um, instead of looking out. Um, what's the evidence for that? And why might this kind of a pattern uh, appear? And the students were really engaged in this kind of a process and could draw on evolutionary theory and social cognitive theory, socialization, raising questions like, um, um, Males might be more concerned about the perceived intentions if they stop and talk to a girl. What if it was a little boy standing on the street instead of a little girl? Then would you have seen differences? And we can get a discussion going that raises those kinds of questions. And again, always trying to keep this centered in some theoretical, conceptual sort of a framework so that they can draw on that. I also think having the theories allows them to say things uh, that they might not feel comfortable saying, because they can say, it's not, I wouldn't think this, but evolution would, yeah. you, know, you know, and so you get, to, you, you get to be able to really take those through and, 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 and consider the evidence. Um, I'm going to skip this one, and I'll show you one more um, clip. Here's one on evolution. They use a skill that women excel at all over the world, language. Well, how's that? I'm speaking a quick language. It's could be the oldest language in the world. It's a language like no other language. You can hear this click that they, that they do. We know that by two million years ago, parts of the brain were evolving for the, the making of language. And so somebody was sitting around talking. They were talking a lot. And I think that 
it was women who used language as a tool. They needed language in order to raise their babies. They would hold the baby in front of their face and control it, reprimand it, educate it uh, with words. Words were tools, women's tools. I mean, you really don't need a whole lot of words to hit a buffalo in the head. You don't need a whole lot of words to describe the children, to tell stories, to spread the news, uh, to gossip, to talk about the boys. that the women who talked survived, and those who didn't died out. <laughs> okay. Take that from an evolutionary perspective. What does it mean uh, about language? Uh, what does it mean about, is language sex specific? Is it sex linked? I don't think so. Um, <laughs> wouldn't it have been useful perhaps if you were about to go out and hunt to be able to say two miles north by the green tree as opposed to having to go two miles north to the green tree? Probably. Um, so, so could we really take that kind of an explanation? Can you, can you accept it um, with, with the, 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 the kind of um, hopeful rigor that we are training students in our classes? Um, that's the course, and I'm going to stop so I can take your questions, um, but I think that'll give you a sense of sort of how we approach these things, the types of questions that we ask, the information that we cover. There's, of course, lots more detail about that on the syllabus. Can you audit it? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually. <laughs> you could, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I don't let students audit it. First of all, it's pretty packed, and, and, but, but I mean, I have a real answer. <laughs> because I think auditors don't participate to the full extent, and then especially with groups and things like that, it, it pulls down the, uh, uh, the overall average. So, yes? You know, that's why we have, the, we have the discussion groups outside of class. And I do that because there's no way if we just really discussed all the information that, that, we're, that, that, that we try to cover in this class that I could get through it. So, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's why, in some way, I, I, I mean, I hate saying this. There's, there, I have to tell you, there's an ambivalence in me about this. But I want this course to be about empirical findings in the social sciences, not about how people feel about them so much because otherwise we can't get through it. But I do care <laughs> about how people feel about these findings and so we set it up outside of class. So we basically designated a time where that's okay. And then as I say mostly I'm lecturing for most of the course. Um, so although I do encourage questions, it's, it's, there's just a kind of a, um, a culture that develops within the class where it's, you know, sort of it's, it's questions based on these theories, questions, you know, and so on and less, less, less information about oneself. Fifty-fifty male, and it's been fifty-fifty male, female for years now. Yeah. Again, when I start, when I came to Stanford and taught this course, it was on the books as the Psychology of Women, and I taught it as the Psychology of Women for um, a few years, and it always troubled me because there isn't a Psychology of Women different than a Psychology of Men. You know, it it suggests somehow that there are differences in ways that there aren't differences. There are special issues that women face and wrestle with and that males face and wrestle with, um, but they're related to gender. And so I wanted to make that clear in the title of the course. I also think it's important, and, and it's historically time to recognize the ways in which gender constrain males. Um, we tended to think that gender is something that does something to women, and then there are humans, there are people, you know, <laughs> and they are the men. <laughs> And it's very important to realize that, that males and females, nobody escapes gender. Even people who, who engage in all sorts of gender bending, they're still very, it's still very much about gender, so none of us can escape it. And I think it's important to, to, to consider that, that whole range in the class. Yes? How well do you feel you Um, it feels like it's working most of the time. I don't know how long it lasts, but in the class, it feels like it's working. Um, 
And again, it's because we just consider lots and lots of evidence over and over. So you see differences, um, say, um, in the, the, the story and cognitive differences, just, just briefly, if you say, well, males and females are different, males are better at certain kinds of cognitive tasks, it's not true at the age of five. You don't see really much of anything in terms of differences in spatial um, orientation, spatial differences. You start to see it begin to emerge around 11, 12 in girls. Um, you know, it, it, so you really look at the evidence and it's just hard to maintain these kinds of beliefs that there are differences uh, that are popularly believed in the culture. They really don't appear to be there. <laughs> Do you find you've got students that are coming forward to admitting that they might, you know, themselves have held um, a very biological belief or something and, and being able to, to admit that they've seen the light? Or <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me say, I think all three of these models actually have uh, a good deal of uh, validity to them. And I think using all of them um, helps us come to some sort, of a, some sort of conclusions that are closer anyway to the truth. We don't have the gender story nailed. So it's not like uh, there, there is a right answer. But you know, it, it's, it's clear that there are differences between males and females at a genetic level, at a hormonal level. We see it in terms of physical disease. We see it um, in terms of hormonal variability. We know that there are these differences. The important question, it seems to me, is to say, at what point do we say we've gone too far in using it to explain complex human behavior? I mean, that's one of the big challenges, say, in saying, well, something was inherited. It's in the genes. Males are aggressive in the genes. Well, there's, there, you know, there are no, there's no known mechanism for humans to inherit, via genes, complex social behaviors. So it, just based on the science, we can't go that far. Does that mean that there's nothing there? No, there's actually some, I think there's some interesting stories to be told based on biology, based on genetics. Uh, there's some interesting work by Michael Meany, um, and he does this work with, with rodents, and so we also talk a lot about how much can you generalize from rodents to humans. Um, um, it's not a whole lot, you know. <laughs> we have a lot more <laughs> flexibility. Um, uh, sex is always a good one. Most of the research that's been done with hormones, say, in, in rodents is, is the yeah, exposed, um, uh, uh, young rodents in, in to uh, excessive androgens, say, and then they look at aggression and so on, or look at differences in mating. But, for example, sex in humans, at least according to word on the street, is a lot more flexible than what you see in animals. You know, you don't always see mounting and, you know, the raising, you know, you know, there's lodarsis in females. That's not what happens in males and females. So there's lots and lots of flexibility in the system. So when you start to say, well, we see this in rodents, but, but that, given that, there is some interesting work, I think, that suggests that in utero exposure to androgens does something to the hypothalamus that changes the reward system such that there's essentially a bigger bang for the buck when one engages in gross motor movement, motor physical activity, gross uh, jumping, flailing around, that that might feel better to little boys than to little girls. I think this is interesting. Now, and it could be at the core of something where we say we see differences in aggression well, if you take that activity level and then you socialize it into beating somebody else up, then it looks like aggression, but could it be activity and how activity feels, motor movement, how it feels for me to do this and how it feels for you to do that. If there's something different in the wiring, that begins to get closer. I'm not, I'm not selling this as this is the answer, this is truth, but that's a way one might be able to think about something genes or hormones might do to people. But again, when you get to the point of saying, is that why men rape? No, it does not explain. You know, you can't explain that in humans through some direct um, genetic sort of explanation. So, I mean, this is long-winded, but I don't try to convince people it's not biology, it is socialization. I think there is a very, very intricate dance that goes on um, between biology and socialization and power and dominance and so on that, that ends up giving us these social scripts that then we say, oh, well, that's just because of biology. It's like, no. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, yeah, one of my intro sites since last quarter is taking a class now. He's a football player, and he absolutely loves it. And he really loves uh, having this space that's not charged one way or the other. And he comes and talks to me about it, about it and, and talks about the exploration that you guys do. And uh, so I'm just wondering, with all these different types of people that obviously gravitate towards your course, the lecture, I understand, that this discussion section, how do you steer that uh, in terms of still making it a learning experience? 
Or do you think that simply just talking things out, that's, that just by default gives something to them as well? Or do you feel that as a teacher you need to get in there and tweak? Uh, no, I don't feel that. I feel the need to address the kinds of concerns that are raised in a class, whatever they are. That's what I feel in this discussion section. So I don't feel the need to direct those. I should say students often direct them. Um, so they will often um, say, get together and go approach the course assistants or something and say, for one of these, one of the evening discussions, could we have some transgendered folks come in and talk to us? And you know we are very responsive to the different kinds of things that people want to see about, want to see, want to hear about, and so we'll try to arrange that. Uh, sometimes there's a movie that somebody's heard about, and we'll try to show that in a discussion. So those kind, that's very open. It's it's the that's I feel like that piece of the course, that and the research group. That's those are theirs. Um, and thanks for letting me know. I like that when I hear. <laughs> yes. I, I'm sure there are people who are resistant to the subject matter. I mean, I, I think that's why Stanford decided to have a gender requirement, uh, so that students were going to have some exposure to these issues, regardless of what they decided they wanted. Uh, so I do think there's, there is some of that. And, and no doubt there are people who take my course, like who take all courses and say, I'm, I, I'm just not interested in this, or I don't like the way this is approached. I have found that at least one way that seems to be reasonably effective is leading with the science and leading with the theories, and that that lets people have a way of thinking about this that is pretty even-handed. Um, and I think that, so I do think that helps and allows us to consider all sorts of different possibilities. And that makes it feel more inclusive, I think. Whether the, I, I absolutely would make no claims that it works for 100%. Yes. Do all examine, like, the biases of the researchers, like, person yeah. asked this kind of, kind of question or didn't study right. this way because they yeah. Yeah. want to prove this? Yeah, we do talk about bias. We talk a lot, actually, even before we get to the theories, the first couple classes are about science, uh, the scientific method, the ways in which bias can enter into the scientific method that we think of as being so pure, uh, the way that we're all influenced in the questions that we decide are important or not important. That is all about culture and socialization. If most research, for example, on sexual orientation and psychology attempts to explain why it is that some people prefer same-sex partners to opposite-sex partners. Why? Why, why, why? How does that happen? And the, the underlying, the, the, the idea here, the implicit, is that what went wrong there? And it's trying to explain that. I think actually one of the much more interesting questions about uh, sexual orientation is the response that sexual orientation, the passionate response that that engenders in people who have nothing to do with the sexual, you know, it's the, that's an interesting psychology. You know, people are murdered because of their sexual orientation. Um, and that's a question that's really worth some attention. But that question is rarely asked. And so, yeah, the kinds of questions that we decide are important ones are very much influenced by culture and socialization, and that we do early on in the, in the course as well. And I think that that is wonderful insight. I think we'll have to call it, bring it to a close. Thank you all very much.